one of our first concerts that we did, the, the critics were complaining that the harps were louder than the bagpipes. So we were quite proud of that. Wow. <laughs> Look at that electro harp go. <laughs> I know. It's be loud. Rawr. <laughs> Hi, Mary, how are you doing today? I'm great, thanks. Hi, Victoria, how are you? I am good. <laughs> I am very grateful for Karina for sending uh, me to you because um, I actually didn't know much about you prior to okay. uh, Karina introducing me to you. And of course, she mentioned you and in her interview. And when I told uh, my team that uh, my next interview is going to be you, I and literally ran into a rabbit hole. <laughs> And look up your very extensive music career, and there are some really great things in there. Yeah. So before we start, tell us about your music journey and how did you end up with the harp? Well, I was pretty musical as a child, and I got piano lessons, and then I got some cello lessons, but we kept moving city, and I ended up not having any music lessons. Um, my sister played the guitar, so I played some guitar. I tried the whistle, I played the whistle. I ended up, we ended up coming to Edinburgh and um, at a certain point in my life, I heard, of course, the Renaissance of the Celtic Heart by Alan Stivell, which is just such an important album for so many heart players. It, it absolutely, I heard it and I went, that's what I want to play. And then I got a harp and that's where it really started. And I didn't have lessons and because I bought a harp with wire strings, which is very unusual, even today it's not a very normal sort of harp, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I had to grow my nails because my fingers wouldn't fit between the strings. The strings were really tight. So I grew my nails and I just taught myself what I was doing and um, yeah. I think what happened after that was that I met Patsy Seddon, who is had been playing I mean I was 21 before I got the harp Patsy started playing when she was 11 so she was like you know one of the top young people in in, in Edinburgh playing I met her at a Clarsach Society summer school Clarsach Society you'll have heard of it's the the society for the Scottish harp that's been going now for 40 years 41 years this year and it's a, a brilliant thing that that and promotes the harp in Scotland and actually in the whole of the UK now and um, rents harps to people who don't have one. So, and they, they do summer schools, which have now turned out of course to be the Edinburgh International Harp Festival, but we can talk about that later. Um, we ended up at a summer school together. I saw Patsy playing, I thought she was amazing. And I was just beginning. I didn't even really know which way around to hold the harp. But a few years later, maybe five years later, we met at university and started to play together. Um, we were in a band together, a band with two harps, which was quite unusual, but that was good. And then lots of people wanted us to carry on. So we did. So we, we got a, a, a duo together, which was called Sheilas, which is uh, Gaelic for Julia, actually. And Sheila Nekepe was a very famous Gaelic poet of her day, a long, long time ago, who wrote or actually composed a poem about the harp and the harp playing in Scotland. And we, we were inspired by her to take her name. And consequently, we, we toured all around the world, really. We came to America, Canada. We went to a lot of Europe. We ended up in Japan at one point. We were in Hong Kong as well. So we did a lot of work. Um, we both then joined another band called the Poozies, which still exists, but only just, and did a lot more work with them with another two harps in the band. And then mm, I think after that, during the course of this, I was playing the Wirestrong harp, which is an unusual sound. And it's quite difficult because it doesn't have colors on the strings. So I, I was kind of, I could play my own harp. I couldn't have played anyone else's harp. Right. But at some point, we, 
one of the heart festivals, Patsy was organizing the heart festival one year and she brought Joelle Garnier, who is the, the father of Kamak Hearts. Do you know Kamak yes, Hearts? I do. Okay, so he came over because Patsy had organized for Kristen Noguez to come and play at the heart festival. And to get her there, Joelle came with her, drove her to Edinburgh from Brittany. It was quite hard in those days to get from Brittany to Edinburgh. So he came with her and we met Kristen, who was the most amazing musician. I'm so sad that she's not with us anymore. I don't know if you know her, but if you haven't heard her music, you should go and listen to that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Joelle came with her and Joelle was the, the, the driver of the Kamak harp boat, he used to call it, and uh, had invented an electro harp, I think the first that actually sounded like a harp. And Patsy and I fell in love with it and we bought one. And once I started playing the electro harp, I just, I, I just felt, I went in a different direction with my music. I became much more open and yeah, you know, we used the harp, the electro harp as a bass sound a lot of the time, so. just had a really great bottom end <laughs> so that's what we did with it okay so then after that I don't know where does life go it just takes you in, various... in many different directions yeah, and yeah. how does the why a strong harp compared to a normal harp because like you said not a lot of us have um, played it <clears throat> and I only know one person who had a, a small lap harp that is wire strung is it very demanding on your fingertip when you play no it? because you use your nails and the the, oh, the, okay. the the action is very much lighter you if you pull too hard you will break the strings the strings are very high tension right. so you have to be much more gentle and a lot of people there's a, there's a woman called Anne Heyman in America who's done a lot of research into how you have to stop the strings because they ring it's like playing lots of little bells Right. And a lot of people find that they want to make this, the noise stop. So there's a lot of people that play concentrating on the stopping. I, do, I just felt like the harp wanted to sing, so I let it sing the way the way it did. But the, the one I play doesn't have very much bottom end. It doesn't go, it only goes down to E. It doesn't, and most of the harps now go down to C. So this one is much smaller. So there wasn't an awful lot of bass thing going on all the time. So I just played lots of tunes on it, but really simple bass, not, you know, not complicated left hand. I use my left hand on the bass. A lot of people have turned it around because apparently that's what they did. Historically, they played the, the left hand at the top and the right hand at the bottom. Very interesting. I, I wouldn't be able to do that. <laughs> that's very hard. <laughs> And speaking of this wire strung harp, <clears throat> it leads me to one of the piece of music that I fell in love with that I didn't even know you had a hand in until I told my team that I was going to be interviewing you, uh, which is Christmas at Sea in yeah. Sting's uh, album called yeah. Eve on the Winter's Night. And I would distinctly remember because I'm a big fan of his. I bought the album. That was the one song that has a language that I couldn't identify. Um, and I was captivated by the woman singing in the background. I'm like, who is that? I have no idea, <laughs> but it was just very different. And of course, when I look at the performance, there was a recording of you performing with him. I think you were playing your wire strung yeah, harp. Yeah, and yeah. you had a, a hand in um, sort of creating that song. Did, what was yeah, it like yeah. for you to be able to bring in the Gaelic language into a song and also the wire strong harp in someone who is pretty mainstream so and well known. <laughs> yeah. know. Well, the way we got to meet Sting, there's a, a woman called Catherine Tickell, who's a Northumbrian piper, and she's worked with Sting a few times. And he, he knew he was making this Christmas album and he asked her, do you know anyone who plays kind of unusual instruments? And she said, oh yeah, this Mary McMaster plays the wire harp. So we went over to his place in Italy and we had a few things to work on in his rehearsal studio and, you know, did that. But then after dinner one night, we, we went and sat in his little, he's got this little bit where he likes to sit after dinner underneath the stairs. And we had a session and we were just all playing. And, and I played a song called Hukrin Hukrin Vidogahi, which is a song I've sung since I was at university, a wonderful song from the Isle of Skye. 
And I played a version of that for him. And then when I got home from that rehearsal, I got a phone call from his manager, or maybe it was an email saying, um, we really like that song, we want to use it. And what it was, was because the song is in fact about going home to somewhere. And Sting has had, had this idea of using a Robert Louis Stevens poem, Stevens, Robert Louis Stevenson poem, um, which is called Christmas at Sea, about someone who's on a boat and it's a big storm and he can see his home, but he can't get home to it. And he just had this idea that you could put the two things together. And he, he hadn't already written the tune for the poem, but because of what I had sung for him that night, he, he then wrote the rest of the song. But I only, I only sing a little bit of the chorus. I don't sing much of the song, so it's just a little bit of it. And it just repeats and repeats. And it's not just me, I have to say, on the album. We had the amazing Lisa Fisher. She's like a mega singer. And there was a really lovely woman um, called Jo Laurie, Jo Laurie, who's Australian. And there was somebody else, I can't actually remember who the third person was, but, oh, Lila, Lila Bialy, she, Lila, Lila Bialy, she's, a, she's another amazing musician, actually. She's a famous, famous singer in America. <laughs> so the, the three of them were backing me singing this song. So it was pretty powerful. And I played the wire harp on it. And so there you go. You've got wire harp and Gaelic on, on Sting's Christmas album. Yeah, it's, it worked it out really well. Job. Oh, it was great. It was so much fun to do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, he's a really lovely guy, by the way. <laughs> really <Yeah. nice> <laughs> That's awesome to know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. always good to know that the, the person that you enjoy is also a nice mm. person. <laughs> yeah. And you have been an inspiration for many people, including one of our guests, Nadia Birkenstahl, who oh, actually right. told us that she started picking up the Celtic harp because she went to a concert that you uh, did in Germany. So she's oh, from wow. Germany. And so you have, you have been playing the harp for a long time and have inspired many. Uh, what are some of the pivotal moments that you have observed in maybe the Scottish harp scene or even for yourself that has really changed or defined how you look at music what are some of the those big moments that uh, when you look back you say those are those are the times that really resonated with me as a musician that's kind of that's kind of a hard question i mean for me personally it was finding the harp in the first place and then meeting patsy and then beginning to play and realizing that the harp is a, is an amazing instrument i love it it's such a great instrument but I mean, people, the younger people, I, I love the fact that people have been inspired to play by, by myself, by the other people who are now a little bit older, but watching the younger ones come along and take the harp even further and even further. I mean, for instance, Karina Hewitt is an amazing harp player and slightly younger than her, Katrina Mackay is just extraordinary. And then there's a whole load of other young ones that are coming in and you know taking it to even further places. So. Those are important moments. Mm -hmm. Having getting the electro harp was really important because then you can be loud. You don't have to be this little quiet thing. Mm -hmm. Meeting Kristen Noguez, and Kristen Noguez was an amazing Breton harp player, which whom we met when we went to the Fest festival Inter Celtique de Lorient. And about 1985, Patsy and I went over there to play and we met Kristen and we were blown away by her music. She's just, she was so fantastic. She write, she wrote music, she's no longer with us sadly, but she wrote fantastic music for the small harp, the lever harp, but without boundaries. I mean, in strange keys with really weird lever settings and with, oh, just, I can't really tell you how wonderful. I thought I found her very inspirational. Not that I could ever play anything like her, but she made me, very happy to listen to her. What else? What else? Oh, working with, with, with Patsy and I worked um, a lot with the Pussies, and then we also worked with a, a band called Clan Alba, which was, um, there was, how many? I can't remember how many. There was, uh, there's a guy called Dick Gochen, who's a really important Scottish musician who played guitar and, and plays guitar and sings. And he got this band together that Patsy and I were in. And we had, we had to play electro harps in that because there was two drummers. There was Dick on guitar. There was 
a fiddle player with an electric fiddle. There was someone on bazooki and guitars. What else did we have? Oh, bagpipes. How could I forget the bagpipes? <laughs> yeah, and um, one of our first concerts that we did, the, the critics were complaining that the harps were louder than the bagpipes. So we were quite proud of that. <laughs> wow. Look at that electro harp go. <laughs> I know. That's it's fantastic. Been loud. Rawr. <laughs> yeah, and it was the electric harp actually that drew me into the harp because um, I couldn't really see myself as those concert pedal harpists, you know, in a big poofy dress. That's never really me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw uh, DHC playing the DHC, and then also there's uh, Laura Samoji is another young yes. harpist. She played on the Big Blue, and she does all kinds of cool effects with that. I'm like, that looks cool. I can be okay with that. I, I, I'm not a classical music person, but I can relate to that. So that was really, yeah, yeah, really yeah. nice to have that option. I think yeah. that's fantastic. And speaking of seeing new people coming along and whatnot, I know Edinburgh Harp Festival is one of those places that a lot of people sort of keep an eye on and see new and up and coming people. Also a place for a lot of harp lovers together every year. And in, I know Corinna has written a piece called The Song of the Oak and Ivy for, I think it was the 30th anniversary for the festival. If wow, I, if that's I, if 10 I, years. Yeah, that was that's 10 right. years. Yeah. 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 And the, it was based on a Eugene Few story that was written long ago, but the music was created by Karina and it has mm -hmm. um, featured a whole bunch of harpists in there, mm -hmm. including yourself and mm -hmm. also Heather Downey, who is one yeah. of our guests. Yeah, I saw that, Tell yeah. us about this piece of music and, and what, what make this project perhaps memorable for you? Well, because we were all harp players, that was really cool. It's nice to play in a band with all harp players because four of us play the, the electro harp. Um, we had a, a Breton guy who plays a, a Kamak Melusine, which is a lovely, one of the lovely Kamak um, electroacoustic, no, semi-acoustic. And there's a guy called Bill Taylor, who's actually American, but he's a fantastic wire harp player. So at certain points there's two wire harps, other points there's four electro harps, one acoustic harp and one wire harp. Very Karina as well. Karina is a great composer. And it's very interesting to be asked to play her music. And of course it was for an anniversary of the Clarsac Society, which she's been a member of longer than I have, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And last year was the 30th, uh, 40th anniversary mm -hmm. of the festival, yeah. which we I think went virtual, right? Because you were supposed to be in person, but you have to cancel. Well, actually, it was the year before. It was 2020. We had to cancel it altogether because we were. The lockdown happened at the end of March, and our festival is at the beginning of April. So we were one of the first music festivals that had to be cancelled in Britain because of the lockdown. So that year, um, one of our number, who's called Rachel here, who's amazing. Yeah, she she person. has actually told us about the story of having to pull everything online yeah. yeah she she kind of organized a lot of people to just send little videos and we put that online but then last year it was obvious we weren't going to get to do a, a live harp festival so we did a more organized um online harp festival so we did a lot of zoom classes and we had a, we, we recorded a few actual concerts in a beautiful church in edinburgh and they they went out and a lot of people did the, you know filming themselves on their phones thing again and sent us those um, and one of the most exciting bits of that was for, we got lots of young people to do that. And there was a sort of series of um, concerts, online concerts with all the young people playing, which is one of the great things about Edinburgh that, you know, really promotes young people playing the harp and helps them to get on and gives them a platform to play on. So that's really good. And we're doing, we're, we'll do something like, again, like that this year. Although this year we're hoping that we'll get some live classes and live concerts, but at the moment we're, you know, I don't know how well it's going to go. It's only three months away and we're beginning to not be able to go out again. So right. this is this new variant. So I don't know what's going to happen. 
Yeah. But we're hoping, fingers crossed, fingers that we'll crossed. get. Yeah, we'll get yeah. some. And you're moving to a new venue too, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. in the website. That's right. Yeah, we we got too big for the venue we were in before, so we've got a new school that we can go into that has many more classrooms, and um, yeah, hopefully it'll work. And the, the the their concert hall is much bigger than the one we used to have, and I believe the seating is more comfortable for anyone who's complained about the pews in the past. <laughs> But we're going to put we're going to record everything as well and film it all and so everyone around the world can have a look that's fantastic yeah, it's and really i'm nice. going to put the link of the festival website mm -hmm. in the video and um, i actually i'm also interested in knowing what is the average attendance of these festivals i have never been to one and i was told that in yeah. it's pretty big there you can yeah. expect quite a lot of people so how many do you usually get well I usually say that there's about 400 class places, but a lot of people do more than one class. So probably around the 200 mark, maybe not quite as many as that actual people that used to come. I mean, that's not gonna happen this year for sure, or next year rather, because I think a lot of people are still wary about traveling and traveling in from abroad is still going to be difficult. But yeah, I mean, our because we would have three class sessions a day and timing wise, and each of those sessions had at least 10 different classes happening. So that's 30 classes a day, yeah. you know, and it, it, it's the teaching element of Edinburgh is really important, really important. And the, the concerts are, are fun. And the late night session is the thing that people used to love. They, they would all because the old venue, we everyone stayed on campus. So we just went into a room and just everyone played until whatever time of night, you know, <laughs> that was really good fun. Yeah. But that will be, that's different now from the, the new venue doesn't have that capacity. Well, we can do a bit of it, but I mean, I, I just don't know how people are going to feel about coming and being in a room with lots of other people. So we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, but that yeah. was what Edinburgh was really famous was for the, the community of the heart world everyone everyone coming with their harps and you, everywhere you looked someone was playing a harp or carrying a harp or yeah great I, I have this mental picture of a couple hundred of people walking around <laughs> with their harp <laughs> going from one room to another yeah. and must yeah. be a pretty incredible sight yeah yeah it's yeah. good yeah <laughs> yeah and I hopefully will be able to uh, come to Edinburgh one day and participate in the festival. Mm. But until that happens, we're going to check out the virtual content that yeah, uh, it's going to be available. That's wonderful. Yeah. And on the note of playing with other people, you have also participated in a project called Songs of Separation, mm -hmm. which was one of the first projects that uh, I came across um, that you were in. And it involves 10 female folk musicians from Scotland and England creating um, and or reflecting on the issue of separation in its many shapes of form. Mm -hmm. And you're one of the musicians in that project. Tell mm -hmm. us about the project. And I think this was from 2015, right? 2015. Yeah. It, the, the person who conceived the project, who's called Jen, Jenny Hill, was thinking about it in 2014 when we had our referendum, our independence referendum, which very sadly didn't we didn't become independent from the UK and some of us were happy some of us were said it was very they split the country almost in half people wanting to leave people wanted to stay but she um, at that time Jenny was living in a an island on an island called Egg the island of Egg which is an amazing island who were the first people the community there was the first people in Scotland to buy their own island they had been owned by a series of really rubbish landlords, landowners, and they, the, the final one was selling the island and they, they had a massive campaign to try and buy the island and they had lots of support from lots of people and they got enough money and they bought their own island. So the, the, the community of Egg is a, a self-sustained and really wonderful independent community. They, they have their own electricity, they have... I, I can't even begin to tell you it's an amazing island really wonderful and Jenny was living on the island and really thinking about independence and she came up with this idea to get five musicians from Scotland and five from England and stick them together in a house for a week and make an album which is crazy really 
some of us had met before, but some of us had never met. We didn't have the material before we went there. We all had an idea of what to do. We got to Egg, we worked like Trojans to try and work out arrangements of things. We chose songs, we worked on them, we practiced them a bit. And then a recording engineer that Jenny knew came up from England to record the whole thing. He brought his, just about his whole studio. His, he said his, his van was about that far off the ground when he was <laughs> driving and so much stuff in it. And in two and a half days, so three and a half days of working on the music and two and a half days of recording, we made what I think was a really, really great album. But there was such great people. I mean, Corrine Polwart was in it. There's a woman called Rowan Rengens, who's an amazing, just an amazing creative spirit. Um, she's half German, half English, plays the banjo and the fiddle and sings, oh, so, such lovely songs. There's a girl called Hannah Reed, who is a Scottish girl who was work, actually went to Berkeley in America. I'm not gonna go through everyone, but the, the, the company was incredible. And the way that we all worked together was incredible. And it was just, what a, what a time. And to be on the Island of Egg to do it as well, because it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place. Uh, lots of fresh air and birds and, you know, sea. And it sounds like a really uh, good environment to uh, be creative in and just, you know, have a, almost like a blank slate. I always, almost feel like every mm -hmm. time I go into, nature it just clears your mind and you start mm. with something fresh and different yeah, yeah yeah it was an amazing week really i'll never forget that i and didn't I, know that you have to like I, I know you were there a week but i didn't know there was not a lot of prep so i, I didn't know a lot of the, the bulk of the work happened yeah. within yeah. that week that's pretty amazing yeah, yeah yeah well to to tell you i had found a song which i then did and i was really happy about that but corinne didn't even know what she was going to sing until she actually got off the boat mm -hmm. and saw a sign about the corn creek which is a bird that we used to have a lot of in scotland and we don't anymore because of farming practices changing but they do exist on egg. And she, she has a song, there's a traditional song about the corn creek. So she just went, oh, that's what I'm going to do. Rowan had actually written a song about up the island's story. She'd read a book and she wrote a song about it. And it's absolutely beautiful. Um, everyone had, had prepared a bit, you know, they brought something that they thought would work. And actually everything that everybody brought worked really well. So yeah, it was just fantastic. Yeah, and the album is available on quite a lot of platforms. So I will also link it so that uh, our audience can check it out. I was yeah. just listening to it earlier this morning when I was preparing my interview questions. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's, it's, I think it's a really beautiful album. I think it's got so much variety, but it sounds really lovely as well. So yeah. we did it in a week. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I saw it on the website, and but again, like I just didn't clue in the bulk of the work happened in there. But mm. it seems like a really uh, a great opportunity just for everyone to come together and mm -hmm. tune their mind to create something amazing. Mm. And I think it worked out really well. We were very happy with it, and and we actually won uh, um, the BBC Folk Awards Album of the Year with it. I think it was the Album of the Year, uh, which was great. That's a great accolade. So. Yeah. Have you had but the opportunity the, not to perform band. as a group on the music since? We did a few gigs um, just probably in 2016, but it was quite a big thing to move about and it costs a lot of money to move about. And it's very hard to, to you know, in the folk world, it's hard to have a thing that's that big that, that you can make enough money that it's, you know, people are getting paid enough and all that sort of thing. So. No, it didn't. It didn't carry on after 2016, but it's a it's a great it's a great remembrance. It's a great thing to have in in your in your past, you know. <laughs> Definitely, and the album is still available, so we can yeah. still listen to it. That's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. And speaking of traveling and sustainability, I know one of the things that you want to talk about was to, um, life as a music traveling musician and your reflection on it in terms of the the carbon footprint that you've left behind mm. what are your thoughts on that um having traveled so much yourself it's it's very hard i i used to think that it would be great if all the musicians could just stay in one place and do concerts and send them out on the internet but of course that's what's been happening on during the pandemic pandemic and it's not the same 
as having live music in a in a room with lots of other people. So I don't I don't know the answer, but I do know that you know in the, from my from when I was about thirty, I did so much traveling, driving and flying, and you know my carbon footprint must be quite big. So I feel bad about that. I know I've planted a few trees though, so maybe that's okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I I really, I think we all have to try and think of a different way of living now yeah. because it, it is serious. It's really serious, isn't it? And then yeah. I suppose in the old days, what musicians would have done would have just travelled around their own country because the world was so much bigger then, wasn't it? So, for instance, a Caroline or Rory Dalkine or, you know, the people that we remember as, as harp players from the old days, they would have just gone from village to village. They might have crossed Scotland, which is, you know, not a very big country, but to, to go across the ocean and to go to Australia, oh, I went to Australia once and oh, I loved it, it was so beautiful, but it's so far away and you use up so much energy getting there. So yeah. I really, I wish someone would come up with a solution even even though i'm not a traveling musician i do commute to work and of course during the pandemic uh i end up working from home for quite an extensive period of time yeah. and when we were told that we're going to start uh, reintegrating back into the office and i was driving in the row with everyone else doing the rush hour traffic and i suddenly realized like i didn't have to be on the road right now doing this i could have done my work at home but but here I am with my car driving to and mm -hmm. from um, with everyone else who is doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, I live in British Columbia and we had some pretty catastrophic weather incidents in recent times. Yeah, yeah uh, uh -huh. all the way from crazy heat to crazy rings. And it just makes me wonder, you know, how different can we be in order to how how much more differently we have to behave in order to make a dent because it's yeah. I think we're trying but I don't think we're doing enough to no. make a dent. To it was so doing. it was so interesting during the first lockdown because everything stopped. There were no planes. There were no cars. I live just on the edge of Edinburgh and there's a park on the other side of the wall after our garden and it was so lovely. You could hear the birds. I think there were more birds. You could, you could just feel the earth going, ah, oh, give me a break from this constant moving. You know, I don't know why people feel they have to move so much. It's something to do with, with our modern world. That I think now, I mean, also when the pandemic started to calm down a bit and people, you know, the government said, oh, you have to go back to work, you have to go back to work. And, and that, then it's, it's come back to being, like noisy and airplanes and you can't hear the birds anymore. And and now, because we've got this other variant, we've, every, everyone's being told to work from home again. It's like, why not? Just work from home. Yeah. So much better an idea. Yeah, and when you just talk about touring musician, it reminds me of a story of a harpist I talked to, uh, Marion Gerby. I interviewed her earlier in the year. She told a story of her and uh, another musician. They travel uh, and toured with a donkey. There was a harp carrying donkey that oh, took them wow. along a, a stretcher row and they were doing the tour like along the way. And I thought that was a very neat story. But what, what you just said to me kind of made me wonder, maybe maybe I need a donkey now <laughs> to carry my harp <laughs> with me. And uh, it's a different kind of footprint, but I, I hope it's a little bit better than, you know, going by car and, and uh, any other more than transportation mode yeah yeah that would be so cool wouldn't it yeah it would be well, that's what they did the old harpers they had a horse and a you know the, quite a lot of the the professional harpers were blind because of yeah. smallpox and things when they were young so they would have a young boy with them to lead the lead the horse and uh, help them to get where they had to go <laughs> yeah sounds good <laughs> And maybe another thing to do, and I don't know, I don't know what it is like outside of here, because I've only really learned playing the harp in the last year or two, and I'm in a place where I don't think there's a very prominent harp scene. But I, I, 
I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Okay. I mean, we have people are playing hard, but I don't think it's, you know, the, it's not necessarily the, the Celtic heart. I think there's quite a lot of pedal or gastro harpist type of thing. Um, but I, I always feel like there's room for um, gather, like local gathering, right? Kind of like what you would do in a session where you just go into a pub or a saloon or whatever they're called, right? And, mm -hmm. and play and enjoy some local music. It, it's a very different feeling than watching each other on Zoom, for sure. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, well, you yeah, can't I... play together on Zoom, really. No, not... you can't, right? <laughs> but wouldn't it be neat if, you know, more people pick up an instrument and just come together well when whenever we can and play locally yeah, yeah. that would be well fun. i guess we do we do quite a bit of that here or we have done quite a bit of that here in scotland that's a thing yeah. but I, there's actually quite a big community in seattle of harp players oh, i'm gonna have to there's a couple of people that i know who live there who, who play harp and are really good uh one of them's mm -hmm. scottish Right. And the other one's American, but he actually speaks Gaelic as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> and my heart was made in Seattle. It's a dusty string. So oh, okay. yeah, I, have, mm -hmm. I have visited them um, just before the the lockdown. And then, of course, the border closed and I can't mm -hmm. even go to uh, yeah. the state now. So I'm going to have so to see. So maybe when, when things calm down, if they ever do, there's what they have, the fish here, the Seattle fish where you can go and it's it's a week of just having fun with other people, learning Gaelic and learning music of different kinds. Like I've taught harp there, other people have taught harp there and uh, they have sessions at night. So it's really good fun. Ooh, that sounds yeah, you so should, fun. If, you could, if you could ever go to that, that would be a great thing oh, to I'm do. I'm going to have to check it out. Yeah, mm. yeah. That's awesome. And I also mm. want to talk to you about McMaster Hay, the musician, not the lawyer. <laughs> you, you remind me and this is uh, a project that you do with Donald Hay who is a percussionist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. tell us about this I think the first thing we, we actually live together we're partners so um we've been together for 25 years now and but it took us quite a long time to get around to actually playing together but we've now been doing it for quite a while we had to do a project for Celtic Connections um festival in Glasgow which is an amazing Celtic Music Festival, it's Celtic and the Rest Music Festival in January in Glasgow, um, which what has been just wonderful. They had to go online last year and I'm not sure what's going to happen this year, but I'm hoping they'll get some concerts. So we had to work something out for that and we, we just started to play together and we really enjoyed doing it. And then we made an album and then we did some touring. We went to Australia, we, were, we went out to um, the Adelaide Harp Festival to, to represent CAMAC because I play Kamak Electro Harp and had a lot of fun out there. And yeah, it, we're both doing other things as well. So Donald's in a band called The Old Blind Dogs and he's very busy with them. And obviously I've been in the Poozies, which is not so busy as it was, but we've got a grandson now. So we're quite busy with that as well. That's very exciting. Um, but yeah, we still play music together and our music is available on Bandcamp if anyone's interested. We have two albums. And one of them, the first album, has that song that, that Sting liked so much, the Hokrin Hokrin Vidalahi song. And our original verse of that. <laughs> And it's, uh, I, I have always enjoyed percussions and I thought that and the harp work together really well. They do, they really do. Yeah. Yeah, Donald, Donald is a very melodic percussionist as well. He, he plays he plays the kit, but he plays, um, he's just very gentle. He doesn't overplay ever. So you can, you know, you can play really quiet, gentle things and he'll just add something beautiful to it. So. Yeah, I yeah, was watching one of the videos and he has, I don't even know what they're called, but it's in his drum set, big circular round thing. But he has his, It's just a big bass drum. Oh, there it is. And he has his uh, mullet. The blue, is the blue brushes? Yeah. Blue and he brushes, just, yeah. Like, so yeah. gently. Like, and I, again, like, I think a lot of people expect a very uh, a 
cue loud sound from a percussion instrument, but he is very、uh, sensitive and gentle with it, and、he、it is, brings yeah, a yeah. different dimension of yeah, sound into the music,、yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, he's got he's got an amazing musical memory as well. He remembers things. You know, we go to a concert, and we'll afterwards he'll be talking about it, and he'll go, "Yeah, that one that went like this," and he'll sing me the melody. I'm like, "Whoa, you remember that? It's amazing." You know, something he's never heard before in his life. He just has he has this memory that works. His memory works. <laughs> yeah, it's do you, beautiful. Do you、um, do you have plans to、uh, do some concerts, hopefully, with、um, Dono and with the? We're hoping to do a little bit next year. There's a couple of、um, things that might. I'm not going to mention them because they might not come off.、Oh. But well, I mean, Edinburgh Trad Fest is going to try and put some concerts on, and they want us to do a thing there. And we're hoping to go to Galicia as well.、Okay. So in, where can we stay in, in touch with the schedule for McMaster Hayes、uh, tour <laughs> potential? Where can we find I, information? I, we have a Facebook page, but I'm I'm really not good at social media thing. So, but I, every now and again, I remember to put something. Hey, I'll, I'll put it on the Facebook page. So there's a McMaster Hayes Facebook page, and、uh, obviously we have a Bandcamp page as well. And I'll tr- I'll try harder to let people know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, that would be nice.、Okay. And what are some of your、um, hopes and、uh, perhaps maybe even for yourself and for the the harp scene in the next little while?、Um, what would you like to see the harp scene head to in the next five ten years? How would you like it to develop? Well, To be honest, since I when I started playing, there was a handful of people. It wasn't. The, the, there have always been a, a lot of people who've been behind the scenes playing in, at home, but since I started playing, which is quite a long time now, the, the, it has blossomed. It has grown really exponentially. It's it's grown a lot, and I just hope that it keeps doing that and it doesn't fall back into being sidelined. You know, because it is such a beautiful instrument. You can do so much on it. There are so many young folk now doing amazing music. Music. I, I meant to mention there's a, a Frenchman called Laura Perrudin that I met when I was in France. She plays a, a chromatic harp, which is a harp that has a really strange shape. It's very long at the back, and it has all the strings on it.、Mm-hmm. Every, you know, you know, because you know you have to make the. The different notes with the levers on our harps. Yeah, her harp has all the strings on it. Oh, is that kind of like、it's、the triple harp, where it has the the sharps and the flats, kind of? It has、or? the sharps and the flats, but it's all in one line.、Oh, wow. So it's a really interesting shape. It, it kind of goes right over her shoulder and、oh, wow. and extends up up like that. But she's a beautiful singer as well. Have have a look look her up. She's amazing. Yeah, I mean, there's loads of people all around the world doing fantastic things. So yeah, my hope is just that they keep on doing those fantastic things and getting better and better. And in Scotland, it's it's very very healthy now, very healthy. There's a lot of people, especially people like Heather Downey teaching, and Karina teaching, and you know all the young ones that they teach take it further, and that's brilliant, brilliant.、Mm-hmm. I, I hope the、um, Celtic harp is going to be more popular.、Uh, I think it's still in where I am considered to be pretty,、uh, where like not a lot of people are、um, aware of it, and it really、uh, it put a smile on my face when、I'm, one of my friends sent me a photo. She went to a school concert, her daughter's and her daughter's school, and there was a, a young lady playing. Uh, a Celtic harp playing one of、uh, DHC's、uh, composition in the concert, and she told me, "I know that's a Celtic harp because I've seen you play with it, and it just <laughs> warmed my heart to see that、um, it's people are getting to know the instrument." Yeah, yeah, I think it probably goes in waves. You know that sometimes it, there's more people that know, and then maybe we get a bit old, and then it, we have to bring the young ones in and get them going. I mean, yeah, hopefully it'll just keep. Keep going up and up and up and up and up. I should have mentioned that the the Pussies albums are all available、um, uh, either through Bandcamp. We have a Pussies Bandcamp, but the older ones are available as online things. So、um, downloads—that's the word. <laughs> so you can also find them. And、uh, yeah, that's. I think that's it.
Okay, I'm so. going to put the links of uh, your music and the different groups that you're in into the video description. I am a big fan of Bandcam. I, ha I know a lot of musicians that I love that are on Bandcam and I'm a big supporter of their platform. So uh, and Bandcam Friday is usually when I go and load up <laughs> on music these days. So I'll definitely include that in the video yeah, description. Great. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for the conversation. I really enjoy getting to know your work and also get to know you a little bit more. Oh, thank you.